Hello, today we're continuing in our series on nuclear physics, looking at nuclear scattering and spin. What is the technique that physicists use for investigating what is going on at nuclear level? Well, it's the slightly unsubtle way of bombarding a target with projectile particles. These are the projectiles, this is the target. You hurl projectiles along at very high energy, you smash them into a target, they come flying off in all directions, sometimes even backwards. And you, what you tend to do is to measure the number which come off at a particular angle. And you put your detector all the way around so you get a distribution of the number of particles coming off at a uh, particular angle. Some people say this is a bit like um, trying to look to see what's inside your watch by taking a hammer and smashing the watch. You smash the watch, all the bits inside the watch come out and you can see what's inside the watch. There is one important difference that when you smash the watch, it's a very silly thing to do, but if you smash the watch, you only see the bits that were in the watch in the first place. When you smash subatomic particles into a target like this, sometimes you actually create particles which were never in the target in the first place. This is because some of the energy associated with these incoming pro projectiles is sufficient to create new particles. So that's the additional uh, dimension here. We'll be looking at fairly low energy, for, at least for the time being, so we're not too worried about uh, creating new particles. We're simply looking to see if you send in a projectile beam, wh what happens to it? How is it deflected as it goes through the target? Now, in my video on nuclear radius, which is in the playlist on nuclear physics, you'll see that I did introduce the concept of a cross section. What I said was that if this is a kind of a nucleus and you've got a projectile particle coming some distance from the nucleus, then it probably will only be deflected by a very small angle. Whereas if you've got a projectile particle that's coming very close to the nucleus, it will be impacted much more and its angle might even be greater than 90 degrees. It might be sent back. And that from the point of view of the incoming particle, you had what's called a cross section. If you want to be this particle here, being deflected through a small angle, then you've got this kind of area to aim at. Whereas if you want to be this particle, you've got a much smaller area to aim at because you've got to get very close to the nucleus. And this gives the concept of cross section. This is a large cross section because uh, you've got a lot to hit in order to be deflected through a small angle. This is a small cross section because you've got a very small area to hit if you want to be deflected through a large cross section. So cross sections are measured in areas and they are usually measured in the units of a barn, as in the barn that owls nest in. It's called a barn and it has a value of 10 to the minus 28 meters squared. So it's, it is genuinely a measure of area, but a very small measure of area. Now, so far in this series, we've considered a bound deuteron, a proton and a neutron bound in a deuteron. Now we're going to consider something slightly different. We're going to consider a beam of neutrons, that's our projectile particle, hitting a target which has protons within it. And we're looking to see how the neutrons are scattered. Now in passing, for those of you who are going to ask, how can you get a beam of neutrons? We know how you get a beam of, pro of protons. That's not too difficult. In theory, if you put a negative charge and a positive charge here, and you have a positively charged proton here, the positively charged proton will be repelled by the positive plate and attracted to the negative plate. And if you put a little, a little hole in the plate, the proton will be traveling faster and faster and faster, whiz through the hole, and you've got a fast moving proton. You just do it by a series of um, electrically charged plates. But if you've got a neutron, that won't work because the neutron is not going to be attracted to positive or negative uh, plates because it doesn't have a charge. 
So the way you have to do it, there's several ways of doing it. One way of doing it is actually to fire protons, which you can accelerate at a target. That will of course produce a whole load of rubbish um, coming off in all directions. But the bulk of it, of course, always comes off in the forward direction. If you look at the number of particles coming off in the forward direction, it's always hugely more than that which is deflected. Those particles will be all sorts of things. But if you put an electric plate um, above and below, then all the charged particles in this stream will be deflected, including any protons that happen to be hanging around, electrons, anything. Any charged particles will be deflected out of the way. And the only thing that will continue will be neutrally charged particles. Now, a lot of those neutrally charged particles, like pions, they will decay very quickly. And what you find is that the bulk of what's left is a stream of, of neutrons. But of course, those neutrons will have a whole variety of different energies. You cannot create a single energy stream. But since kinetic energy, kinetic energy is half mv squared, then the higher the energy, the higher the velocity, and the higher the velocity, the sooner that neutron will get to the target that you're actually aiming at. This is the neutron beam, this is the target. So the neutrons that get there first will be the highest energy. And then the neutrons that arrive later will be of lower energy. And of course, electronics are set up such that they measure the time for all these bursts. And you know when the neutron hits the target, how long it took, you know the distances, you can calculate the velocity, you can calculate the energy of the neutrons over time. That's the way it's done. Or at least I could say that's one way it's done. So let's go back to our famous diagram for the nuclear potential. I've drawn this many times now. Nuclear potential is plotted on this axis. The separation of the proton and the neutron on this axis this is R0, which for a deuteron, remember, was 2.1 Fermi. Uh, this is 0, and this is the nuclear potential in the deuteron, which was minus 36 MeV, and we called that V0. When we were talking about a deuteron, we put in a binding energy, which was minus 2.225 MeV. But now we're talking about firing ne neutrons at a target containing protons. That is now our experiment. These are individual neutrons which are being fired at a target containing individual protons. We're not talking about a deuteron anymore. We're still talking about a neutron-proton interaction. So the interaction is still going to be the same, but it, they are no longer bound. Indeed, the energy of the neutron is up here. So instead of having a binding energy, which is a minus term, we've now got a positive energy because the neutron is free. Once again, we can talk about two regions, the region inside the nuclear potential and the region outside. And now we go back to our old friend, the Schrodinger equation, which we've used so many times in our videos in this series minus h bar squared over 2m times d2 psi by dr squared plus v psi is equal to e psi. That's the time independent Schrodinger equation. And you may recall in an earlier video, I pointed out that the mass is the reduced mass of the combination of the proton and the neutron. So we can rearrange this formula to say that d2 psi by dr squared is equal to minus 2m over h bar squared into e minus v psi. That's just rearranging this. You take the, the, this over to this side, so it goes upside down, 2m over h bar squared with the minus, and then you bring the v over here so it becomes minus v, and that's a rearrangement of the Schrodinger equation. Then we say for region one, where the potential is V0, so V is V0, we can say that for region one, D2 psi by dr squared 
is minus 2m over h bar squared into E, which of course is the energy of the neutron, minus V0, where V0 is the depth of the nuclear potential, times psi. Re region 1. Region 2 is the region where there is no nuclear potential. V is 0 here. So we've got d2 psi by dr squared is equal to 2m over h bar squared e minus nothing. So it's just e times psi. Now, as I did before, I'm going to put a box around these two terms because I want to persuade you that those two terms are both positive. e minus v. Well, E is a positive term, V is a negative term, so you've got E minus a minus term. A minus minus is plus. So E minus V0 is E minus minus 36. So that's E plus 36. So E plus 36 is positive. Similarly, E is already positive, so this is clearly a positive term. Consequently, we can do the old trick of calling this k squared and this l squared. And the reason we wanted these terms to be positive was that then k and l will be real numbers, not imaginary numbers. So the minus terms are left on the outside. And that means we've got essentially the restorative force, the simple harmonic motion equation. This is the equivalent of acceleration. This is the equivalent of the uh, um, the frequency, and so you've got a force that's in the opposite direction of the uh, motion, and that's a restoring force. And we've set, we've shown this in previous videos. Essentially, you've then got just an oscillation term in both cases because you've got minuses in both cases. You remember the last time we did this, this was an oscillatory term. This turned out to be an exponential term, but now they are both oscillatory terms. So that essentially we've got, in region one, d2 psi by dr squared is minus k squared psi, and here d2 psi by dr squared is minus l squared psi. And as before, we can write the wave function, which will be an oscillatory term, and the way of writing that is a sine kr plus b cosine kr. That's for region one. And for region two, also um, oscillatory, that's going to be here. That is going to be C times sine LR plus D times cosine LR. Now, for the first region, we can say, going all the way back up here, that when R is zero, the wave function have to be zero. So when r is zero in region one, r of zero is never in region two, of course, because region two doesn't start till r equals r naught. So it can only apply here. When r is zero, the wave function is zero, sine kr will be zero because the sine of zero is zero. The cosine of zero is one, so b times one is b, so b equals zero. Consequently, that term goes if b is zero. And in region one, this is the value of the wave function. But you can't do that for region two because you haven't got an r equals zero in region two. So you have to stick with both terms. But I hope to persuade you that that is one and the same thing as e times the cosine, sorry, e times the sine of lr plus delta, where delta is a phase angle. And how can I demonstrate that to be the case? By looking at the identity, which says that the sine of x plus delta is equal to sine x cosine delta plus sine delta cosine x. You can look that up on uh, Wikipedia or Google. That is a standard um, uh, geometric or trigonometric, should we say, trigonometric um, uh, equality. So if I put an E in front of all these terms, 
I'm just multiplying everything by E, that's perfectly all right. And if I call E cos delta, um, the value C, and if I call E sine delta, the value D, and if I say let X equal LR, then you've got that E sine LR plus delta is equal to C, which is the E cosine delta term, if delta is a constant, times sine X, which is sine LR, plus, and then E sine delta is D, times cosine of X, X is LR, cosine of LR. So this term is the same as this term. Then as before, you say that at R equals R naught, that is the boundary of the two regions, the wave function must be continuous and the gradient, that is the derivative of the wave function must be continuous, which means that when R equals R naught, this term equals this term, and the derivative of this term equals the derivative of this term. So let's, well, let's see if we can keep them both in, in place. This term is simply A sine KR, and that's going to be equal to this term, which is E sine LR plus delta, but at the value R zero, because it's at the boundary that that is true. Similarly, the derivatives are equal. So the derivative of this is going to be Ka cosine Kr0 is going to be equal to the derivative of this, which is Le cosine Lr0 plus delta. And the Lr0 plus delta are all part of the sine and the cosine function. And if I regard this as equation one, and this is equation two. And what I'm going to do is to divide equation two by equation one. So I'm dividing this by this. Uh, A's are going to cancel out, and what I'm going to get is K times the cotangent of KR zero is equal to this term divided by this term, the E's cancel out, and I'm going to get L times the cotangent of LR zero plus delta. I'm going to remind you that we know what K and L are. Um, K squared is this, L squared is this, so K and L are just the square roots in each case. We know the mass, we know the energy, that's the energy of the neutron. We know V zero, that's the depth of the potential well. Here we just need to know the energy of the neutron. So all of K squared and all of L squared are known. We know R zero, that is 2.1 Fermi's. So we know everything in that equation apart from delta. And that means we can calculate delta, the so-called phase angle. I'll explain more about phase angles in a little while, probably in the next video. And so you can solve for the value of delta. Now it turns out that that value delta is related to the cross section by this formula. We, we will not dwell on how you get to it. Uh, because that's not the point we're trying to make in this video. So the cross section for a particular angular distribution is for low energy, and this is what we're talking about here, one over k squared sine squared delta. Okay, that's an angular direction, uh, cross section for a particular value of theta. But you can look at the cross section, what one might call the total cross section for all angles, which is the integrated version of this, and that comes out to be four pi over k squared sine squared delta. So delta, you can see, is related to the cross-section. So if you've got uh, delta, you can calculate the cross-section. And if you ca calculate the cross-section in this case, neutron-proton scattering, you get five barns. Barns, remember, is a unit of area. And we said that one barn is 10 to the minus 28 meters. So small cross-section. But when you measure it experimentally, so this is now the experimental measurement, you get 20 barns. So the theoretical derivation and the experimental derivation are significantly different. Something has gone wrong. What has gone wrong? 
Well, you remember that when we spoke about the deuteron, we spoke about the uh, potential, um, the nuclear potential V. Uh, this is zero. This was the binding energy. This was the depth of the nuclear potential. We speculated, if you remember, that you can have an S equal one contribution in this um, nuclear potential and it's contributing to it, but that you couldn't have an S equals zero because we speculated if you did, the nuclear potential wouldn't be as deep. Consequently, the deuteron would not be bound because the binding energy would be up here somewhere. And therefore you wouldn't have a deuteron, you would just have a, a free neutron and a free proton. So we said you can't have an S equals zero term in a deuteron, you can only have an S equals one term. Because if you have an S equals zero, it's not bound. But now we're talking about neutrons scattering, neutrons scattering um, off of a proton target. They aren't bound. This is not a deuteron. So this arrangement can have an S equal one and an S equal zero effect going on because they're not bound. The only reason you didn't allow an S equal zero in the deuteron was because it is bound. We showed earlier that there are three states for the S equals one state. That's one H bar zero and minus one H bar, each separated by H bar. Whereas of course there's only one state for the S equals zero spin and that's zero. So there are three times as many states for the S equals one as there are for um, S equals zero. Consequently, you can say that the experimental value of the uh, cross-section, which we measured at, remember, 20 barns, that is going to be equal to 0 0.75 times the sigma for s equals 1, i.e. plus 0, uh, 0 0.25 times the sigma for s equals 0 three times as many. Okay, three quarters of your contribution is gonna come from the cross section associated with S equals one, which is the one we calculated, because this all contains the S equals one um, uh, potential. Whereas you're gonna get a quarter, which is gonna be contributed to by the S equals zero potential which we didn't include in the nuclear potential because we said it wasn't allowed. And so you've got that 20, which is the experimental value, is 0 0.75 times this value, which we've calculated, assuming the nuclear potential only has a S equals one term in it, plus 0.25 times the cross section associated with S equals zero. And I think if you work that out, you get that the cross section for S equals zero comes to 65 barns. Whereas the cross section for S equals one comes to five barns. And once again, what we're demonstrating is that the nuclear potential is highly spin dependent. So this is giving further evidence for our speculation that that nuclear potential term has a high degree of spin dependence.